Hey, what's going on, guys? Ben Brewster here, Triathletics. Uh, I want to touch on a, a topic today uh, that's that's come up recently, which is should pitchers stretch their arms? Um, we can kind of uh, elaborate a little bit on should pitchers stretch in general. Um, we'll touch on some of that as well, um, get into some of the nitty gritty. Um, and again, hopefully you guys can take something away from this video. So um, this was a, kind of a tweet or Twitter thread um, that kind of got me thinking about this topic. Um, now I'm not here to call any, you know, call any names, uh, offend anybody, anything like that. I actually end up uh, in this video, you'll see I actually end up agreeing with 90% of what they're getting at. Um, but Tom House said, I work with some of the best throwers in the world. They don't stretch their arms. And then I believe this is one of his partners, uh, Dean. He says, flex, don't stretch mobile joints. I think push, not pull. Um, you know, they eliminate stretching and replace it with flexing and isometric body weight work. Um, you know, never stretch the shoulder. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and link this tweet uh, in the video description so you guys can go ahead, click that link, and then watch their discussion on this topic. Um, so uh, they actually kind of elaborate a little bit more and uh, really get at some of the same things that I end up getting at in, in this video in my response. But um, kind of that initial statement, you know, the best throwers in the world don't stretch, like a very absolutist statement. Um, I want to get into, you know, active versus passive stretching, why active stretching is commonly done. Um, and some of this is kind of semantic and a terminology thing, but um, I really just wanted to give kind of my perspective on the topic and you can kind of see, you know, where, where my thought process lies uh, in regards to stretching, mobility work, uh, tissue work, all that sort of stuff in regards to, to pitching. So I said, um, you know, we work with some of the best throwers in the world as well. Some of them do in fact stretch their arms and I put that in quotes because again, we need to define what we mean by stretching. Um, rarely are we talking about stretching external rotation, so someone just passively cranking on your arm. Um, but there are often times that opening up a dense toned up lat or pec minor is very helpful. It's not a black and white topic. So uh, here to discuss some of the kind of gray areas with regards to stretching and, and why, you know, uh, I felt some of that, uh, that initial tweet was a little bit misleading in terms of, um, you know, what a random 15 year old might have thought uh, watching that or reading that. So first, uh, goals for this. Uh, how do we define stretching? I kind of give my my definition and um, or at least discuss the different types of stretching. How do we define the arm? So what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about the glenohumeral joint? Are we talking about the scapula? Are we talking about the elbow? Um, who should stretch their arm? So is stretching appropriate? What type of stretching? And then who might this be appropriate for? In what context? And then who should not stretch their arm? Uh, so, you know, first and foremost, just uh, establishing, I uh, talked about this a, a bunch, but range of motion and pitching. I think we can all agree that range of motion has, has some validity. Um, you know, out of range of motion can increase the distance over which force is applied uh, to the baseball uh, and magnify the stretch shortening cycle or the, the elastic rubber band-like qualities uh, in your connective tissue and in, in your muscles. Um, you know, you can see this in multiple different places within the delivery. It's not just, uh, you know, with regards to uh, you know, shoulder layback, um, but we look at retraction and, and scap loading, right? This ability, Ben Joyce, perfect example here. Range of motion is, is extremely important in the ability to get into that deep stretch position so that you can then be able to kind of fire and apply force over that longer range of motion uh, with regards to retraction to ultimately protraction and ball release. Um, layback as well, there's a reason you don't see hard throwers who have, you know, 120 degrees of, uh, you know, active layback during the throw they all tend to approach that 170, 180, 190 degrees of total layback, right? There are moves like Ben Joyce's arm moves if they're gonna throw 95, 100 miles an hour in general. Again, big reason there, they're applying force to the ball over a longer arc of motion. They're able to get that true whip-like mechanism from back to front and their arm isn't just moving like one stiff board. Hip shoulder separation, another place range of motion uh, plays a role. If you rotate the hips and the shoulders together or you land completely open, uh, you're not able to apply that force over as long of range of motion. You're not able to create that torque and create that uh, elastic recoil-like effect through uh, that entire anterior oblique sling. And then even, those are kind of the three most obvious places that range of motion are important in the throw. But even areas uh, as kind of insignificant seeming as hip flexion. So look at Ben Joyce's uh, left leg right here. As he gets into ball release, the ability to, to have to create that hip flexion, hamstring mobility, um, be able to be able to follow through over that lead leg through that lead leg block uh, to elbow extension right if he was missing you know 30 degrees of elbow extension as he went to finish over that front side he wouldn't be able to stay on the ball as long and wouldn't be able to again continue applying force to the ball over his longer range of motion so there's a bunch of joints all working together we're looking for this ideal blend of 
uh, range of motion or, or mobility um, with also a, a requisite level of stability, again, depending on the joint. Uh, it's important to have strength and control in any range you do possess. Um, so, right, we talked about increased layback, increased hip shoulder separation, increased retraction, increased hip flexion, elbow extension, right? Um, there's a point at which that, that joint is super restricted and it can limit, again, your efficiency. But there's also a point where uh, more is not better, right? I have worked with hypermobile athletes who have far, far too much range of motion that they just can't control. And what makes it too much range of motion is that they can't control it, right? If you have the ability to control it and fire out of some of these positions, um, now that becomes potentially advantageous. If your arm just kind of flops behind your body and you have no power behind that, now that's potentially disadvantageous. So again, Tom House and I agree on that. Uh, more is not always better. We need to have strength and control of that range of motion that we work to get. Um, and then you also need to be able to time it. So the patterns do matter, right? I was a guy with a lot of uh, potential range of motion. Um, you know, I could, I could get into good positions, um, you know, in a side lunge or in a push up or et cetera, et cetera, early in high school. Like I, ha I was a good athlete um, and I had good mobility out of context, but you put me on a mound, um, you know, with a hitter in the box and you tell me to throw and I didn't actually know the timing or have, have the timing or the patterns to sync up that mobility and actually exhibit it on the mound. This is why somebody can go into spring training throwing 92. As soon as they're, they're sync up by the end of spring training, they're, they're out of their throwing 97, back to mid-season form, right? It's not that their mobility changed, they just got their timing down, they got the patterns down, they got their release point down, and now they're ready to go. Uh, so again, opening up range of motion alone is not enough. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a second, but there is a difference between flexibility, which is you know, it's more passive range of motion and, and mobility, which is again, active range of motion. That's what we're after from performance. We talked about Ben Joyce um, before his big unlock was after Tommy John surgery, he's began placing a huge emphasis on upper half mobility and on hip mobility as well. So for him, and we'll talk about what he, some of the things he did, but um, he had already thrown hundred without placing a ton of emphasis on mobility. He just had pretty good patterns. He got brutally strong. And he was, you know, upper 90s, touching 100, got TJ. And then as soon as he able, was able to start opening up some of that range of motion, he said he started to feel tight. Um, going into TJ, he just felt restricted. That's when he started getting this velocity bump consistently sitting over 100 miles an hour. So it's strength through length. It's opening up these ranges of motion with control, pecs, lats, uh, the trunk, the obliques, the adductors, the hamstrings, etc. Let's talk about different types of stretching. Um, you know, really the, the two broad classifications are passive versus active stretching. Passive stretching would be something like you just lay on your back and a partner, uh, you know, just takes your takes your leg up as far as they can and it gives you a hamstring stretch. You're not doing anything actively in that stretch. So while you potentially can improve your ability to relax into deep passive stretches, right? This is what a lot of yoga is, is, is kind of passive stretching. While you increase the stretch tolerance in those scenarios, you're not necessarily increasing your active control of that range of motion. So we look at the top right. Um, this is uh, one of our coaches, Chase, doing a, a kind of pec wall stretch uh, type movement. Right? You don't know just looking at this necessarily whether he's doing it actively or passively. Passively would just be putting your arm up on a column or on a wall, turning against it, and just hanging out there. That's passive. You're just uh, taking those uh, muscle attachment points away from each other, and you're just kind of hanging out, relaxing, and trying to improve that, that passive stretch tolerance. Active stretching, you might get into the exact same position, but now you're trying to contract and drive into the pole, and then you're trying to retract and pull off the pole, sink a little bit deeper, contract, contract. Um, and so there's different ways that these techniques, these active techniques are added into some of these stretches. So I would, cons I would still consider this stretching. A lot of people will call this active stretching. Um, some people will call this end range isometrics. But again, what is end range? End range is taking that agonist muscle, it's taking that pec in this example to its end range. It's putting it on a stretch and now it's doing isometrics in both directions so that you can, again, achieve that activation and build strength, build control at that range of motion. There's a whole uh, you know, classification and certification called uh, functional range conditioning, FRC, that uses this technique with great success. Um, and so we do incorporate some of that stuff, some of the end range isometrics or active stretching, which is a type of stretching uh, into our routines. There's various other protocols. Um, most of you have probably heard of PNF, uh, which is kind of a combination. It's a contract, relax, uh, 
example where you go into it as far as you can passively, then you might do a contraction, hold it, now you relax again, go passively further, contract again. So it's kind of a combination. And there's other types of stretching as well, dynamic, ballistic, and those serve kind of more, uh, more as a warm up roll. But what about something like a four inch motion lift? So let's look at the kind of ass to grass squat on, in the bottom right. Is that stretching? Well, I would argue that that is a type of loaded stretching. If you are truly going to full range of motion, if you're doing a, a push up with the hands elevated and you're going to, you know, a stretch through the pecs, you're still taking that, uh, taking both attachments of the muscle to their end range and firing out of that. So that is, I would consider lifting through a full range, a type of loaded or active stretching as well, right? He's still getting a big hamstring stretch, glute stretch, adductor stretch in that deep squat. Everyone doesn't necessarily need to be able to squat that deep. There's differences, et cetera, et cetera. But certain types of lifting can absolutely improve mobility in various positions and improve that, uh, that active strength component as well. What about tissue work? Uh, tissue work is, again, it's not necessarily stretching per se, but one of the primary ways that we will open up mobility is if there's a tone issue. If your body is just holding a ton of tension in a muscle, then working through it with a lacrosse ball or various other active release techniques or tissue work techniques can absolutely help open up uh, the, the ability of that muscle to tolerate some stretch. So that is absolutely a piece of what we do from a mobi mobility standpoint as well. Whether you want to call that a type of stretching or not, that's more a kind of a gray area. So again, these are all tools that can be used in the right context. Doing a passive stretch doesn't automatically mean you're going to go get injured the very next second that you do anything. Um, but in general, I would argue and I would agree with, uh, with Tom House and MPA that in general, passive stretching is less relevant for pitching. I'm just calling this isometric concept active stretching. So it is still a type of stretching in my opinion. Um, now, in some contexts, passive stretching can be negative. For example, doing a ton of passive stretching five minutes before you're going to go throw a bullpen, um, you know, there, that has been shown to, to reduce power output uh, potentially. So you wouldn't want to go do a ton of hamstring isometric or hamstring passive stretching and then go and run sprints, for example. Um, so there are cases where it may be a negative. You're not gonna hurt yourself if you do a five second hamstring stretch, but it's one of those things where you're gonna get more bang for your buck from a performance standpoint, uh, if you focus on passive stretching. And it's really just to hammer home this point, it's really not about hitting this, hitting a position, right? It's not just about hitting a position when it comes to sports. In yoga, sure, in yoga, if you can just get into, relax into a side split, something like that, it might just be about hitting a position. Um, in sports, it's really about powerfully firing out of or in and out of various positions. So here's just a, another example. Again, we can look at examples with the arm. We can look at example with, with the lower body. I just thought this was an easy one to identify. Let's say we're talking about the, the lower half, the adductors. Uh, Chase Petty gets into you know crazy positions, but it's, it's not that he just hits a static position here on his back leg, which is why he throws 100 miles an hour. He has the ability to hold that tension, hold that load, hold that stability on the back foot, on the back side, and then still be able to fire out at that. So if we look to the right, it's like what positions, what exercises, what types of stretching uh, will most likely give us the capacity or build the capacity to even have the potential to uh, elicit some of these patterns on the mound, right? Is it uh, something where you're actively holding that position, taking your, your adductors to a, a lengthened position and then actively contracting uh, like on the top? Or is it something where you're just kind of hanging out and letting gravity do all the work for you? And obviously we all can see um, and, and understand like the ability to have strength in that position is going to be have far more carryover to sport for what we want. And while I've never done what this, you know, Juji Mufu up here on the top right has done where to that extent, I've gotten pretty darn, darn close and I did it in a three or four week uh, period few years ago where I just got into kind of the side split uh, floor, floor squeeze type stuff. It was all active. It was a few sets a day. It was nothing crazy. And that it, the speed at which that range of motion improved was pretty mind blowing. Like every two days I could get another inch deeper, inch deeper, inch deeper. And it's not because I was physically lengthening the muscle fibers. Um, a lot of this is just, it's neurological. It's your body starting to say, okay, this isn't a dangerous position. I'm going to give you a little bit more. I'm going to give you a little bit more. And being able to, uh, it's increasing the the control and the the uh, ability of your body to actually trust that you're not going to break in that range of motion. So your body starts to take off the governor of that position, and you actually get quicker results with this active type stretching from a mobility standpoint than you get 
in most cases from just this passive approach. Let's talk about the arm. So what are we really talking about when we say should pitchers stretch their arm? Uh, I think really the point Tom House was trying to make is like from the glenohumeral joint, it's a, it's a very mobile ball and socket joint. It's designed for mobility. You know, we probably don't need to be torquing on that right before a start, right before a bullpen, right? We can agree on that. But just saying the arm and stretching, again, it's kind of vague. There's more joints to be talking about. Are we, what are we, what about the elbow joint, right? The elbow joint, again, it's not just a hinge joint. There's rotation happening as well. What about the scapula? The scapula is still part of the arm. Uh, scapular thoracic joint, we'll touch on that as well. Um, from the glenohumeral joint standpoint, again, I, I do agree that in general, we probably don't want to be doing passive stretching for the glenohumeral joint. Um, pitchers do develop a ton of anterior glenohumeral uh, laxity. They're just throwing repeatedly over and over and over and over, and they're stretching out the front side of that of that capsule and developing this anterior laxity. Uh, Billy Wagner in the bottom right. I, just, I mean, this is a crazy, crazy example of that. He's a guy super lax, um, probably demonstrating 200 plus degrees of, uh, of functional layback in that position. And so this just this over time, again, you, you already are uh, inducing such such a laxity in the glenohumeral joint that it probably doesn't make sense to do any sort of added stretching into external rotation. On top of that, um, there are very isolated cases where I have seen guys that are extremely, extremely limited. They've tried everything else we can throw at them, and they do start adding in a little bit of external rotation, loaded type stretching movements. That's, again, a 1 in 100 scenario um, that we, we have seen before, and we have seen that work. Um, sleeper stretches, there's on the top there, again, not our go-to for increasing uh, you know, functional internal rotation uh, range of motion because, again, a lot of times you can open up some of that range of motion um, through other means that aren't necessarily potentially destabilizing that glenohumeral joint. So think tissue work for the back of the shoulder um, and, and things of that nature before going and trying to crank into uh, crank on the joint into internal rotation. So from that standpoint, definitely agree. Um, the posterior capsule and the posterior cuff um, will compensate in general uh, for this anterior laxity by, by adding a ton of grittiness, density, and, and tone and tension to the back side of the joint. Um, in general, this is somewhat inevitable. There's going to be some level of, uh, of imbalance relative to your non-throwing arm. But again, this is something that you don't want to allow to get too severe. You don't want to allow that total arc of motion, the total range of motion on your throwing side to get massively skewed from your non-throwing side. There will be some asymmetry, but that total arc of motion between the two, uh, we're trying to get as close as we can within 5, 10, 15 degrees uh, of that non-throwing side. Uh, so one thing that we do uh, is if we do see an athlete that's missing a significant amount of layback, I've made a video on this, which I'll try to link uh, link here as well. Uh, but if you're missing a significant amount of layback, uh, see if you can address that layback from other areas first. See if there's an other, another potential cause to that restriction first uh, before you do something like cranking in this bottom left picture, before you just do something like cranking into uh, actual glenohumeral joint external rotation. So can we open up the pec minor, which is more an attachment on the scapula, and get the scapula to get out of the way a little bit better? Can we open up the thoracic spine a little bit better? Can we find ways to get into better positions without necessarily getting it from that, uh, that anterior uh, side of the glenohumeral joint, from the glenohumeral joint, which already has this anterior laxity? Let's talk about the scapula now. Um, so uh, when we think about the scapula, the scapula is a floating joint, right? It's really position is dictated by all the tissues that attach on the scapula. So you can think of this as this, this huge tug of war in space with all these different muscular attachment points. You have the rhomboids, you have the lats, you have the uh, serratus anterior, you have the low trap, upper trap, all these levator scap, all these different tissue points that are attaching on it and having this, this tug of war. Um, what you'll typically see is that the big strong muscles are what win that tug of war and it's going to skew that scapula out of the ideal alignment and restrict it from being able to get into some of the positions over time that as a thrower you need to be able to get into. So uh, this can alter the mechanics of the scapula. Um, we can see, we see pitchers with limited uh, you know, scap retraction in their throwing delivery. We'll see them with limited upward rotation during an assessment. Uh, we'll see them with limited posterior tilt, like where the scapula is kind of dumped into anterior tilt and they have an inability to really generate that clean posterior tilt and get into some, some clean layback positions. And so the shoulder takes up more of that, uh, more of that layback, because their scap is stuck forward. So their shoulder takes on more of it, as opposed to being able to get the scap out of the way. 
Um, so that's something that we do see. As far as kind of some of the muscles to, to strengthen and activate, we really try to do our best to uh, activate and strengthen the serratus and the low trap muscles, which again are going to be responsible for allowing that upward rotation to occur, which is what is often missing in pitchers. And tissue work or some combination of active stretching for the muscles that are going to be responsible or overworked or chronically toned up or, or dense or gritty in pitchers. Uh, the biggest ones are going to be pec minor, lat, and subscap. So the pec minor, as that starts getting toned up, that pitcher's scap is going to be dumped forward. The lat, they're going to be dumped into downward rotation and depression. And then the subscap, again, as the subscap gets super gritty, we see a huge link between that and between shoulder pain or uh, shoulder impingement type symptoms. So those are like the absolute three biggest ones that we need to keep that tissue clean. Um, and again, some combination between tissue work first to open up or just improve the actual hydration of that tissue, which oftentimes that's most of the battle, but then taking that little window of opportunity you've created, taking that hydrated tissue and doing some sort of loaded active uh, mobility work for it. If you wanna call that active stretching, if you wanna call that end range isos, I don't care, um, but that's a way to really solidify and build that range of motion. So here's an example of many. Um, you can do you know, a single arm, uh, single arm lat stretch. Um, this is not a totally passive thing where someone else is just yanking your arm overhead. The grip is activating the entire shoulder girdle. It's activating the rotator cuff. It's activating the lat. The feet are still on the ground and you're driving that lat uh, into a lengthened position. And again, that's something that you can do after uh, this tissue work for the lat to work on, again, getting into even deeper positions with control. So one example of many that we could look at. Uh, the elbow. So obviously another important part of your arm. Uh, well, the elbow is, is a hinge joint uh, designed primarily for stability. It also does have a rotational capacity as well. So there is a, a rotational capacity built into the elbow joint, obviously a hinge capacity as well. Um, again, despite it being built and designed for stability, uh, your elbow does require adequate mobility as well. So if we only had this much range at our elbow, right, that's not a very functional range of motion to be able to perform this uh, this arm spiral, this unfurling of the arm as we see in Jacob deGrom here. So it's hard to say black and white, this joint is only designed for stability, this joint is only designed for mobility. There's a blend of both. With our elbow, we want fairly close to full extension, fairly close to full elbow flexion. We also want it to be stable. So it's gonna be more skewed towards one end of the spectrum uh, versus the other, but it doesn't mean that that, that skew can't be uh, can it can't be kind of uh, ruined over time depending on various injuries surgeries uh, compensations etc so when it comes to elbow extension uh, this is extremely important for the actual deceleration component being able to get that adequate arm un unfurling of the whip that arm spiral and that that deceleration pattern what you'll oftentimes see guys who are limited in elbow extension is they get here get here get here get here get here run out of room and then the shoulder finishes the throw because they run out of room with their actual elbow extension to be able to have this smooth deceleration arc. So they run out of room and then the shoulder kicks in and they'll sometimes feel like a, a collision or tension happening in their shoulder or grinding happening in their shoulder. And it's simply because that stress has to go somewhere. And if you run out of mobility in one segment, it's going to usually go up the chain. So elbow extension can be important. Another big thing, if it happens to be linked to a ton of bicep tension, uh, again, the bicep tendon attaches up to the labrum. So excess bicep tension absolutely can, uh, can stress and can tension the labrum and can be, a, be one factor in terms of labral pathology. So that's an important piece. There are cases where bicep stretching, active bicep stretching can be warranted. There are cases where uh, bicep tissue work can be warranted. Elbow flexion, to be able to get into some of these positions, again, you don't need to necessarily have 100% full elbow flexion. I've seen guys that, you know, they're 10 degrees off after surgery and they never have any issues uh, for the rest of their career, but you also shouldn't be so limited that you can't even get remotely close to touching your shoulder. Um, again, your arm is going to, it's not going to move in that natural uh, whip-like capacity if you have these major mobility restrictions in flexion or in extension. We look at it from a uh, pronation and supination standpoint. Uh, you can see here, there's a, there's a thrower down here on the bottom left where He's developed a major imbalance um, between his throwing side, his left arm, and his non-throwing side, his right arm. And so this is extremely relevant for throwing, 
sliders for throwing curveballs, anything that requires supination to be able to get around that pitch is going to be very, very difficult to throw if you're missing supination. So there are cases where pronator flexor tissue work, um, pronator active stretching on the bottom right uh, is a resisted pronation uh, mobility and or prehab uh, movement that we'll use where again, you take your arm, you take your, your forearm, your wrist into max supination, and then you're doing activations where you're activating the pronator and building strength and control in that range of motion. So again, whether you wanna call this stretching or end range isos, um, those are just some additional uh, specific examples. So who needs stretching? Now I've already given you some examples, but I came out with a, I came up with a little bit of a, a kind of spectrum to show uh, how different Different pitchers, different athletes are going to have different needs depending on uh, their issues, depending on their injury history, depending on their genetics. We know mobility does have a very strong genetic component. A lot of us know someone who's hypermobile or who has elbow hyperextension or just when they're standing there with their knees locked, their knees hyperextend, um, you know, their fingers can bend backwards. Um, so there's, you know, it's not black or white. It's not, there's the hypermobile people over there and everyone else is not hypermobile. It's all on a spectrum. Um, so joint laxity, the actual looseness of our joints, the looseness of our of our ligaments um, is a highly genetic uh, thing. Um, but along with that, there's also other factors that influence our mobility. So there's tissue tone, right? There's the amount of uh, there's the amount of tension basically that our our body is regulating in all the different muscles in our body. Uh, there's there's fascial adhesions, uh, which can develop over time as a result of stress, uh, as a result of scar tissue from surgery, injuries, et cetera. And so all these things factor into the amount of available uh, mobility that we have throughout our entire body. So on the left side, we have uh, hypermobile. On the right side, uh, we have what I would consider ultra stiff movers. Um, so I kind of have outlined it here, hypermobile. Um, I see this, I put less than 5% of the time. It might be less than like three or 2% of the time. Um, it's fairly rare that you see someone where it's, they're so, so hypermobile that you're like, that is just too much mobility. I wish I could just tighten up their joints, tighten up their springs a little bit, but it does it does happen. These are the guys with 210 plus degrees of total arc of motion in their throwing shoulder. Their arm almost flops. They have so much range of motion in their arm. Um, this can be a problem because now you're on this far end of the spectrum. Now you have in these instability concerns. Uh, injury risk is associated with with this hypermobility. Uh, it's just, you know, what I typically see when I see someone who throws very hard, but they also have a ton of elbow hyperextension. Uh, in a lot of cases, these guys do have a fairly lengthy uh, injury history, not just for their, their elbow, but also potentially for their shoulder. So these are guys generally don't need stretching. They don't need uh, much range of motion type work, um, but it's, it's much more, uh, you know, isometric type work. So we're not necessarily taking them to, uh, you know, where they're feeling a stretch, we're just taking them to what they can actively control and doing isometrics in that position. Uh, loose movers, right, I might fit in this category myself. This is not maybe another 20% where uh, these are guys who probably need more so strength and stability work, but at the same time, some of this tissue work, some of this active stretching work uh, can be beneficial at times as well. I don't tighten up very easily, um, but at the same time, if I totally neglect mobility work, in my arm for months and months and months, or if I don't throw for a few months and then I come back and I start throwing, I can notice a difference. Um, and so a week or two, for me, it doesn't take much at all to feel like I get that range of motion back, to get into those better positions, to feel that top corner of my arm action, be able to open up and the ball start jumping out a little bit better. So, you know, loose movers typically don't need a ton of mobility work. Um, you know, stiff movers, kind of the opposite. These guys tend to need a little bit more regular tissue and mobility work. Um, they typically tone up a little bit quicker. So if they just hammer out, you know, two days a week of bench press and just never do any sort of mobility stuff at all. Uh, these are guys who will start to kind of drift towards, uh, you know, seeing their arm action get a little bit stiffer, not being able to get into as good of positions in their delivery and start to notice it over time. And then there's the guys who I would consider the ultra stiff movers. These are the guys where, you know, when they were 13, 14 years old, um, before they started getting into lifting, they, you know, they had a pretty decent delivery. They could get, in, you know, their arm worked pretty well. Um, you know, they added 100 pounds to all their lifts. They gained 20, 30 pounds, and they're throwing the same or worse than a couple of years ago in a lot of cases. Uh, these are the guys that tone up super quick. You, you know, you have them squeeze their pec, squeeze their lat, and even at, with a very gentle amount of pressure, it's 
excruciatingly painful. Uh, they have just, to their entire body, it's just they stare at a weight and they, they seem to tighten up. Um, it doesn't mean that these guys shouldn't weight lift. It just means that some of these guys will need a ton more mobility work than the loose movers than the hypermobile guys. And again, the concern there is performance decrease. A lot of these guys don't throw hard because they can't create any separation. They can't create any layback. They can't create any scap retraction. Their lead leg doesn't work properly. They just, they move like a refrigerator. And so these are the guys that you don't typically see at the big league level uh, just because it's such an uphill battle for these guys. Um, this is, again, I would say under 10% of the, of the guys that we see at the high school and college level. And then at the big league level, I would say, I don't know that I've ever, ever seen ultra stiff uh, mover, uh, at least how I would define it at the, at the big league level. So here's a, here's a Raldis Chapman. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, right? There, there's a huge genetic component here, right? He's a guy who he's hypermobile. He's always been hypermobile. He's always going to be hypermobile. It's the literally the, uh, you know, how, how loose his ligaments are. He's always going to be able to touch his elbows, elbows behind his back um, and, and have that type of kind of ridiculous uh, level of mobility, right? So him doing a bunch of bodybuilder workouts, not going to be a problem. He's almost certainly not going to uh, lose out enough, lose enough range of motion to where it really negatively affects him or he really notices it. That doesn't mean that you or I can just go do a bunch of bodybuilder workouts and get away with it indefinitely. You might be able to if that's your genetics. If you're an ultra loose mover, if you're a hypermobile guy, you might be able to. But if you're an ultra stiff mover and you go and try to do that type of bodybuilding program, that is going to be a highly detrimental uh, approach from that standpoint. Uh, these guys both would consider them loose movers. Ben Joyce, again, he threw 100 with just doing bodybuilding workouts and not really focusing on mobility at all. The important, and then on the right here is one of our coaches, Gabe Noyalis, who uh, threw 90 in college, uh, played at Division three, was pretty weak. He actually ended up walking away from the team. He went and did bodybuilding, powerlifting type training for a couple of years, came back throwing 94 at an alumni or went through an alumni game. A month later was throwing 94, a month later was throwing 97, 98. And he's a guy where even though he doesn't do a ton of throwing right now, at any point in time, he can pretty much just hop on the mound, throw 94, throw 95 if he wants to. He maintains his mobility extremely well despite not placing a ton of emphasis on mobility himself. And then Ben Joyce, I think it's important to note, like even though he didn't do a ton of mobility and he got away with it very well and still threw 100, it doesn't mean there wasn't still a little bit of room for improvement once he did begin cleaning up that final variable. So loose movers can absolutely still get some benefit out of doing this additional mobility work. I think there's another piece to, uh, to saying that uh, elite throwers don't stretch, which is a little bit of survivorship bias. First off, a lot of them do stretch. I'm not saying that they should do passive stretching. Here's Justin Verlander. There's a video of him doing you know, a ton of passive stretching pregame. I'm not saying that he should, right? I'm not saying that he should, but there is some sense of survivorship bias where uh, the athletes that make it to the highest level are typically going to be the guys who are a little bit closer to that kind of loose mover side of the spectrum. If you're one of these super tight movers and I've coached them and I've played with a couple of them earlier on in my career, it's such an uphill battle for those guys to throw with any sort of efficiency. Those guys just don't throw 95. They don't make it to that level in most cases, right? That's just that's just kind of the the reality, the harsh reality of the situation. Those guys are not going to ever be Olympic gymnasts, right? They're not genetically primed for mobility, and it doesn't mean that for them mobility isn't the most important piece that's going to be a differentiator and get them closer to the center. But it just means that most of the guys that make it to the big league level are already loose. They don't do a ton of stretching because they don't need to do a ton of stretching. And they're just the ones that have survived and made it to the top. So a lot of them do stretch. Ultra stiff movers don't generally make it in pitching, uh, which selects, selects for these longer, looser movers that just have it. Um, doesn't mean mobility work is not important uh, for the arm. It's just more important for the stiff movers. Um, and again, we've kind of already covered what, what survivorship bias uh, is and how that can lead to you know invalid conclusions. Um, Again, just to rehash this point, the, what the best in the world do is not always optimal, right? DK Metcalf eats candy all day and then eats one real meal a day, right? That doesn't mean that that's optimal, and we can all agree that's not optimal. It just means that some of these guys are, are so far and beyond superior genetically that they don't have to necessarily do every little detail right to still go out there and throw 99 miles an hour and be one of the best in the world. 
So that's just a very slippery slope argument to say that because certain elite throwers do something or don't do something that everyone else should be doing the same thing. Right? Ben Joyce threw 100 without even focusing on mobility. Um, it doesn't mean that he had the perfect approach. Look what happened when he did start adding in mobility work. So how good could some of these guys potentially be if they begin to dial in certain things? More of a hypothetical. Uh, big takeaways. Uh, I think, you know, myself included, we, we all need to be careful about speaking in absolutes. Um, I'm certainly guilty of this myself. Twitter is difficult to fully uh, bring context to such a you know, such a short tweet. Um, I try to map out these things in threads. I try to be responsive to people when they bring up counterpoints so that I can clarify uh, when there are gray areas. I try to make videos like this clarifying the gray areas um, so that it's not, I'm not just leaving things at absolutes and uh, potentially being misleading to depending on the person reading it. But most things are not black and white. And having these discussions, being able to hash out the, the gray areas is where we actually all learn and, and can uh, appreciate the, the fundamental differences between different types of athletes. Um, mobility and stability both matter. So it's not an either or. It's not as simple as saying one joint is designed for this, one joint is designed for that, one joint is, yes, there's a skew, but right, your ankle is a mobile joint, but it still needs some stability. Your knee is a stable joint, it still needs some mobility, right? That, that it, both matter. So don't let the pendulum swing too far in one direction uh, for no matter the joint, they need both. Um, regular soft tissue work never hurt anyone. Um, again, I don't view soft tissue work as being directly about increasing mobility. Um, I view it more as a, uh, from a health standpoint of improving the hydration of the tissue so that it can not, both, not only contract better, but also it can, uh, has more extensibility. When put under stretch, it's more, it's more pliable tissue. So any secondary increases in mobility as a result of tissue work are purely icing on the cake. That's not the primary focus of tissue work. It's more from a health standpoint. And then active stretching versus passive stretching. Um, generally, we want to avoid and limit passive stretching of the glenohumeral joint. Uh, we can absolutely all agree on that, I believe. Um, but that doesn't mean that all stretching is bad for the arm. So active stretching, I'm a big fan of active stretching, big fan of tissue work. Um, but let's try to have a rationale for any mobility work that we do. Um, let's try not to just go out there and stretch to stretch, right? If you have a guy who has plenty of hip flexion and control of that hip flexion, like we don't need to spend 10 minutes a day doing hamstring stretches. If you have a guy with more than enough uh, range of motion at a certain joint and control, we don't need to spend a ton of time doing that. Um, so as, as athletes needs change over time, the program should, uh, should change in accordance to that. And we just need to be aware that it can be a slippery slope. I'm very much pro mobility uh, when it when it is needed by a certain athlete in that context. But I've also seen the downsides of giving someone two hours a day where they're going through joint cars and tissue work and foam rolling for every single joint in their entire body, and two hours go by and they haven't even start, picked up a ball and started actually throwing a baseball, and now they got their lifting. It, we can be a little bit more targeted targeted with what we give athletes and be able to align their programs depending on their specific needs so that they are maximizing the actual efficiency uh, behind their warm-up, behind their, their mobility sessions, and it doesn't turn into this long, drawn-out uh, process where it's more inefficient than anything. And then finally, lifting through full range of motion. Uh, I think loaded stretching, this, this is one of the most efficient ways to maintain mobility. So let's say you do work, you do work hard to open up your chest uh, and, and improve the tissue quality and maybe even do some, some active stretching. Um, this can be maintained, in my experience, pretty well by holding some sort of full range of motion lift uh, for their for that muscle in their program. And from there, it doesn't, depending on the guy, it doesn't always take that much tissue work to maintain it, that much mobility work to maintain it. Getting there uh, can initially take, you know, three, six, eight weeks of work, but maintaining it is often much, much easier than actually getting there in the first place. Uh, hopefully you guys got some value out of that. Drop your questions down below. Uh, let me know if I missed anything, and uh, we'd love to hear from you guys in the comments. If you're not already subscribed to this channel, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, thumbs up, all that stuff. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Thanks again.